Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is television sports audio engineer Jerry Palumbo. First, let's talk a little bit about the future of vinyl. I recently read an article that asked a number of people that were very intimate with the vinyl business, and these included small record labels, they included pressing plants, they included record stores, they included major labels, they included magazines. And what was very interesting was the fact that almost everybody was kind of negative about the future of vinyl. And they had various reasons, but the fact of the matter is, it seems like we've hit the max vinyl, so to speak, right now. Now, some of the things that they were talking about, for instance, is now that we've solved the supply problem, now they're finding there's not enough buyers for the supply that's there. So that's one factor. Another factor is the fact that over the years, there's been a lot of chemicals that were originally used in vinyl records that have been outlawed. So the formulations have changed, which means that the vinyl itself has changed enough for the better, which, you know, that kind of happens with everything. The other thing is vinyl might not be sustainable over the long run. There may be a point in time where vinyl is actually outlawed and that whole business goes away. Now, that doesn't look like it's going to happen in the near future, but it's possible enough that everybody's wondering and worrying about it a little bit. Another of the problems is that prices seem to be driven higher these days. And there's a number of reasons for this. One is the fact that the labels aren't pressing enough, that what will happen is they basically print just enough for it to become a very high-priced used item, but not enough for it to sell through in the record stores. And as a result, the prices are higher, and of course, that eliminates some of the buyers. In the UK, shops are really worried about Brexit because much of their inventory comes from the United States, and it comes from Europe. So prices are going to be really expensive should Brexit go through. And finally, one of the big problems is the fact that the latest generation that found vinyl, that really loved vinyl, they're buying a lot less. And the reason why is they've pretty much filled out their collections already. So they bought everything they wanted, and now they're not seeing as much as they want, so they're being a lot more selective. All of this put together kind of means that maybe we've seen the peak of what vinyl could be in terms of sales. Now, we knew it was never going to get huge, but perhaps we've seen as high as it will go. If you have any questions or comments, send them to questions at bobbyownercircle.com. The second edition of my social media promotion for musicians handbook is now available on Amazon, iBooks, Ingram, and a bookstore near you. It's the manual for marketing yourself, your band, and your music online, and it covers how to use virtually every important online platform for promotion. Also, you might want to check out my courses at bobbyosinskicourses.com. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is auto-tune, which has gotten a universally bad rap, and maybe rightfully so, but if you look at the history of it, it's actually pretty fascinating. When it comes to audio software, auto-tune was considered to be the holy grail. And many companies tried it for years and years and really couldn't crack the code. And a guy named Andy Hillebrand did. What was interesting about Andy was the fact that he was a mathematician who had worked in the oil industry, specifically for Exxon. And he saw an opportunity and left Exxon and started a company called Landmark Graphics. And what they did is, up until that time, when an oil company got a map to decide where to drill, it was a 2D map. And Andy came up with 3D seismic maps. And as a result, his company got fairly rich and he sold it to Halliburton for $565 million. So Andy had a bunch of dough and he's basically retired. And because he grew up as a flute virtuoso, he decided he wanted to get back into music and kept on looking around to find what he should do with the music. And he was asking a bunch of people at a NAMM show, what is it that people really want? A woman that was there who was the wife of a business associate basically said, can you help me sing in tune? And he kind of laughed it off and forgot about it for about six months. And then it dawned on him, wait a second, maybe this is a really good idea. So then he set out to build auto-tune. 
And he found out that most of the problems were the fact that it needed a huge amount of computational power. So everybody went the way of thinking, well, we need a supercomputer to make this work. Where Andy was a mathematician and he went the opposite way. He tried to streamline the mathematics of it in order to get the same computational power, which he did. So Antares was launched, and at the first NAM show that it showed, it was a huge success. Huge. All of a sudden, it made its rounds in the professional audio industry. And we all used it to some degree or another. Most of the classic engineers that I know probably don't use it as much as many of the younger guys use it. That being said, soon enough, it became one of those things where it was almost a household word. And that was because Cher, with her huge hit, Believe, and then a little bit later, T-Pain. And T-Pain actually became the face of Antares Auto-Tune for a little while, and they were in partnership. But it turns out that T-Pain turned around and sued Antares, and Antares sued back. They went back and forth, and then Antares looked at it and thought, well, wait a second, when we look at the numbers, we find that T-Pain isn't really helping or hurting our sales, so maybe we should just settle and get on with it, which is what they did. Now, Antares owns about 90% of the market but still sort of has a bad rap. But the way you have to look at it is, like just about everything in life, it's not really the tool, but it's the person that uses it. It's not the hammer, but it's how you swing it. So it's not the fact that you're using auto-tune, it's how you're using it that really makes the difference. So the only thing I can say to wrap this up is, be very judicious on how you use auto-tune, because more isn't necessarily better. Jerry Palumbo is a broadcast engineer, audio mixer, and RF tech who's worked on high-profile sports shows for more than 25 years. She's been part of the audio team for all of the most celebrated sporting events, including the Super Bowl, NBA, and NHL playoffs, and most recently, the World Series. Not only did Jerry have some great stories, but she also explained so much about what goes on behind the scenes at a sporting event that we never get to see, including the many types of audio jobs and even the hierarchy of NFL games. I spoke with her via phone from her home in Los Angeles. I was checking out your bio, and I saw that you went to Juilliard as an orchestration major, which is very impressive to me. I'm a Berkeley guy, and I know it didn't take much to get into Berkeley, but Juilliard <laughs> had a much higher standard, so I know that uh, it, it impresses me. Can you just go back and tell me about your music career first, and then we can get into how you get into broadcast audio? Sure. Everything's kind of been an accident, except Except for the music side, I grew up in a um, a musical family. My mother, uh, her name was Maxine. She was pretty well known on the East Coast uh, on the John Boy and Billy show, but she was a jazz musician her entire life. And my grandmother was a multi-instrumentalist as well. And my great-grandfather made violins. He was actually a minister who had four daughters and all of the daughters played guitar and just ridiculous violin and piano. And they all play, They were all schooled musicians. They were all readers. But they also had amazing ears. So my grandmother, one of the four sisters, obviously, she had eight children. And every one of them played. And they all played really well. And they were all multi-instrumentalists. So... I just kind of grew up around it. Uh, my mom and dad both played music. I played music from a really small child. And we would visit my grandmother, who was also living in the same town where I was. And, I mean, it, we were always jamming. So, to me, it was just like a, a normal part of life. Where was that? I grew up in West Virginia, believe it or not. I was born in Cleveland. My father was from, from Cleveland, and my parents met... Uh, actually in Mexico, that's, that's another story, but, but I was born in Cleveland. So we lived in Cleveland the early part of my life. And, uh, my dad decided he just didn't want to raise the kids in the city. And, uh, in hindsight, I don't know how wise that was to move us to West Virginia. Cause I think when you're bored, sometimes you get into more trouble, yeah. you know? Uh, in other ways, I, I went more into the music side because I kind of went more internally for my 
stimulation. So maybe it was a good thing. I don't know. But I grew I was kind of bored there. I love it there now when I go back to visit. But I was like, you know, I kind of was a type A kid in a in a rural town and always looking for something to do, you know. Yeah. And uh, music was kind of my escape. So, so I was just lucky, you know. So the Juilliard thing, really, to be honest with you, um, when I was in high school, my band director, he just saw a knack for orchestration and music theory because I had it so much growing up from such a small age that he really encouraged me to go into orchestration. And he was having me doing charts in high school. So it was kind of, I wouldn't say it was easy in Juilliard because that's a performance school. And even though I performed well, I wasn't, I wasn't what I would call a stellar performer on my instrument. Like those people are, you Mm -hmm. know, those people are masters of their instrument. And I was just, yeah, I played okay on the piano. I was all right. And if I practiced, I would have been better, but I, I did, just have a knack for orchestration. And I think I just got lucky to be honest with you, Bobby, you know? And then you got a break as an orchestrator. I, I, I did. It was, it was the fact that I could do charts that landed me a a deal. This guy by the name of Jeffrey Sargo, I don't even know where he is today. And I don't know where this project is. I have a couple of the recordings somewhere was doing a record and he got my name somehow because he wanted to take his music and he wanted to go into the studio and record with a bunch of musicians. So he's looking for an MD or somebody that could chart things out. So I kind of entered the picture randomly. Here I was like 19 and he thought I was 27 yeah. uh, and I didn't tell him any differently. But um, I got this job, put in his, his charts and his music together. So we would go into the studio at the time. It was called Intergalactic. I think it was on the Upper East Side in the 80s in New York. And I went in with Jeffrey and his musicians. He 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 assembled all the musicians. And I would just go in making sure everyone was cool and playing what they needed to be playing. But I, it was there that I was sitting with the engineer who had a Fairlight. And he made the recordings of what we were doing sound so amazing like a thousand times better than the way it sounded when it was being tracked and i was just i don't know i was curious that i don't know i had mixed feelings bobby i was like i loved it and hated it which is the story of my life (laughs) it's like wow man you you've got waves and you're actually manipulating them with this pen thing and i was like i don't know how i feel about that is that a good thing is that a bad thing i don't know um but I I was insanely curious, and I sat there with that engineer, and I can't even tell you his name because I, 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 I don't even know his name, to be honest with you. But I sat there with him, and I kept going back while we were recording and making sure that the recording was the same as what we had charted, and I was just mesmerized by this piece of machine and mesmerized by what he was doing. So I think that was the first inkling that I was probably – a little bit more hooked on that side of the glass instead of the other side. That and two, I think because of the orchestration aptitude, I think I had a better aptitude for what he was doing than I was as a player. Because I really needed more discipline, Bobby, you know, to be a better player if I really wanted to be on the other side of the glass. Yeah. You know, so it was just kind of an accident. And I was also working at Radio City Music Hall at the same time. I had the best gigs ever. I just got lucky. I, I was going to school at Juilliard, and my, in my, my day gig was working at Radio City Music Hall doing the Christmas show and whatever other shows were, were running through there at the time. And here I am, like 18, 19 years old, and being exposed to this uh, amazing hall and amazing creative people. And I don't know. I just was really lucky, Bobby, you know? Were you orchestrating at Radio City? I was physically charting things while I was working at Radio City in, in, during some of my down moments at on site, but I was not doing it for them. Actually, it was a goal of mine when I was in school. 
to actually orchestrate for them. But, you know, life took a, an interesting turn. I ended up on the studio project, so um, that never happened. How did you get from there? I know you went to post-production. How did that happen? Well, I left New York for a number of reasons. Uh, yeah, my family was back in West Virginia. It's I kind of jump all over the place. I went back to West Virginia, and I stayed. I was going to stay for about a year. I was kind of burned out on school a little bit, but I, I went back to West Virginia, and I ended up accidentally in this rock band called Stratton Alley. And the band ended up kind of taking off, and we ended up, believe it or not, having gigs that paid us really, really good money. We did a lot of original tunes, and the band ended up kind of blowing up for us. So I kind of ran that, that um, you know, for a couple of years and then moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, mainly because there were more gigs in Charlotte than there were in rural West Virginia. We had to travel to Charleston or in Virginia or Roanoke. We had to go a long distance in order to, you know, pay our bills in that band. So in Charlotte, we were able to play locally more frequently for the same pay, and it just seemed like the right move uh, at the time. So that's how I ended up in Charlotte. And there was a post house in Charlotte, and, and my jump to there is kind of convoluted too. But but while we were dealing with the band in Charlotte, I was doing IT work for First Union, doing land systems and and things like that for uh, uh, the bank First Union, which ended up being Wachovia. And then eventually um, I just went into post-production full-time and got out of the IT world, primarily because I felt like I felt like I had the technical aptitude, Bobby, to do the IT stuff, and I really loved it, but I was missing the creative aspect, and I felt with my musical background that a perfect marriage between the IT world and something creative would be to apply that technology in post-production. So I went to Winthrop and I went back to school to try to fill in some gaps and some things that I felt technically might be missing because I wasn't doing post-production until I went back to school. What kind of projects were you doing? At, at the post house? Yeah. Well, I ended up at this place called Mediacom. And what's funny about Mediacom is that Mediacom was a secular post-production house that had several uh, audio rooms as well as video rooms. And we had, at the time, we had the Avid, and we also had the Avid Audio Vision. So the Avid editor was really, really hot at the time. But the, the sister company to Mediacom was also INSP, which was a, um, a Christian network. And a lot of the gear that came out of uh, Jim Baker's Heritage USA was actually the gear that ended up at Mediacom. So a lot of the projects that were in there could, could be in-house, meaning I would be doing post-production work for some of the shows that were airing on ISP. But a lot of the shows through Mediacom were really about the community uh, at large, which is racing. There was a new show called Race Day that started airing out of there and Totally NASCAR and what were some of the other shows that aired out of there? So I was working on some of those shows uh, in the post house. But the, the, the jump to live really happened again by accident. And I have to tell you, Bobby, that I, I've told this story so many times and sometimes I, I don't think it comes out quite the way I would like it to is that the me being thrown into the hot seat on a live show was such an accident. And I kind of went in there, you know, they drug me in by my hair basically, but, but I have the utmost respect for Jim Roller and Tom Cavanaugh and Tony Prada who came into my room and said, we really need a live mixer for our show this Sunday. Um, will you do it? And if they had not asked me to do that, I, I would not have had this spectacular career to this day. And, and the reason I got that gig that Sunday was because they were out of A1 mixers in town. There were people either had conflicts with the schedule 
And several people, uh, and this is why I need to, to, to really drive home how much respect I have for them, is that it was a live hour-long show that would precede a NASCAR race. Had a lot of viewers on TNN. We had two site mix minuses, live satellite feeds coming from uh, live on site wherever, and it was a live show that you were mixing live and there were a lot of people that just were afraid of that crazy hot seat and for me um but it it, for me it was an ignorance is bliss kind of thing (laughs) you know i did remember telling tony prada and 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 tom cavanaugh i was like i was like i don't do live i do post and they're not the same oh you'll be fine jerry i I, I, you'll just be fine you're in here on this big harrison and this is small yama you'll be fine you know, <laughs> and I tell you, it was um, hair raising, but I I just somehow made it through that show and and uh, and it was off to the races really after that um, doing remotes. And um, it was all by accident. And I was like, what are you going to pay me to send me where? <laughs> well, was it because that you did it once and then people saw that you can do it? So then you just got other gigs from that? Yeah, because there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of audio people who will do front of house. There's a lot of audio people who will do monitors, which I think is a calling. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that will mix, but there's not a lot of people who will crawl into that crazy truck. I mean, it's it's utter chaos in the truck. It's a, it's it really truly is a hot seat. There's a lot of pressure in that truck. I mean, I I still see it today. The thing that happens in sports that's different than what I see out here in the entertainment world is that, again, the ignorance is bliss, is when you are out doing a live remote sporting event, you are responsible. You as the A1 are not only responsible for your show, all your tape roll ends, all your elements, all of your music, and mixing all of that transmission. You're responsible for your transmission, but you're also responsible for comms and dialing in all the communications for the show. So you're really wearing two really big, diverse hats. And when you crawl into that truck, you, again, you don't know any better. It's just part of the gig. And, and I used to say for years, man, you need to split off the comms from the A1 and let the EICs do it because we're busy mixing a show and we might not be able to troubleshoot your AD cord line until a, a break you know, because we're mixing. And uh, it's like that to this day. So I kind of feel like, you know, two of the hottest seats I believe in a live television production truck are the A1 and the TD. You know, I think they have the most stress on them. And uh, there's just not a lot of people who want to crawl in there and take that stress on. So I think for me, the fact that I was already on the A1 list, I was already doing some of the A1 stuff in town now anyway, um, they were like, well, Jerry's an A1, we'll just hire her. And sometimes it was a beautiful thing, and sometimes <laughs> it was ugly, 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 ugly. And that's part of it, too. It's, you're working your way through the mud, you know? Yeah. Most of the people that are listening to this are studio people, so they may not be familiar with what an A1 stands for. Can you describe what an A1 is? Okay, so the A1 would be the the main broadcast mixer that is sitting in the broadcast truck. So let's say if it's a college football game or NFL or whatever, the A1 would be the, the, the person that is sitting in the broadcast truck. They're at the top of the audio helm. They're the audio supervisor of the event. They're the ones that decide where they want the mics, they're the ones that are mixing the show. They're the ones that, that everything goes through before it leaves the truck and goes to master control. So they, they are, in fact, in the hot seat. In fact, with sports, I'll break it down for you. The A1 is the primary mixer, broadcast mixer. Um, if, if you are, let's say, doing NFL, you have the A1, who's the primary mixer, you're going to have a submixer who sits in the broadcast booth and does nothing but mix the, the effects that you hear on the field. Then you have the, the booth audio, A2, 
who wires everything inside the building in the booth. And then you have your field A2 who wires everything in the field that you hear. And then you also have an RF tech, radio frequency tech. And that person's sole responsibility is to set up all that gear and to listen and monitor the, the RF, set out all the antennas and make sure everything is, is working properly and keep the RF clean. A lot of times that RF might get dumped onto the submixer. It just depends on the budget of the show. Uh, and if you're really lucky, you'll have a comms tech as well. So really, really big shows like Thursday Night Football, uh, Monday Night Football, uh, probably Sunday night. I have not been on a Sunday night game, but I'm making the assumption that they probably have individual techs for those positions. On a normal NFL game, sometimes, uh, you know, one person might wear a couple of those hats. But most of the people who, who work in this environment, as long as most of us have, most of the people that work in that environment have done every one of those positions at some point. So it, it's, it makes it, um, one, you have empathy for the A1 because you've been there. Two, you have empathy for the RF tech because you've been there, you know. Yeah. And there's usually not a lot of ego uh, with the people that have been around a long time because, they, they, you know, we just kind of roll around and do whatever's necessary to make the show happen. I'm curious. So you've been doing this for a while. How has it changed from when you first started? And I would think that, Maybe the RF tech didn't have that in the beginning, right? Is that a correct assumption? That is a very correct assumption. In fact, I've moved more into RF teching than to anything else, but, but it has changed enormously since I started. First of all, everything in the truck was analog when I was doing it, which was, you know, mid-90s. Mid-90s moving into, you know, mid-2000s, things st started to change more to digital. Um, we started adding... Uh, particularly when Fox Sports came into the equation, because first it was ESPN uh, and CBS, and then Fox Sports came in, and they were a new player. And they seemed to be pushing the envelope when they first came on board. You know, they, there were a lot more bells and whistles and dings and dongs. And, you know, every time a, a graphic would slide onto the screen, we'd have a new bell and whistle and ding dong that would go off, and they'd want us to roll that in uh, to the show. And how we were rolling our music back there at God, this is really dating, dating me, but we had Brunoli disc and then we had zip disc that would go into uh, a 360 system. Oh yeah. And the 360 system was, oh, you know it. So we, it was a way for us to hotkey, um, you know, a lot of our music cuts. So, so we wouldn't have to upcut something when we bump in and out of commercials and we could reload our music and yeah, kind of make it somewhat error-free. I do remember rolling stuff off a off a off a disc, believe it or not, and you'd have to sit there and cue that stuff up. I've done it off of DATS before, um, but the 360 system at the time when we were actually mixing back then, one we had an analog board, two we had the 360 system, and we would we would roll our music in stereo. Well, when the bells and whistles started happening, we would add another 360 system. So now we're eating up four faders on our, of real estate. We now have uh, introduced the EVS and the profile machines, which are now, um, uh, they have replaced tape playback, which was stereo. And so, you, you know, your stereo, you've got your two stereo faders, and now you've got an EVS machine, which has got four channels on it of audio. So now, you know, things just got bigger and broader. Um, and more complex. We started, for me, I started seeing uh, that I was running out of real estate on the board. And then, and then it, uh, one of the last shows I was mixing for ESPN was when they were starting to, to oh, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because when, when you're doing a sports event, 90% of the time, let's say you had an ESPN game going on, they'd want you to do an international feed, which was usually just effects. So you'd send out a, you know, a stereo pair, this is before a fine one, of just your effects. Um, and then they could put their own announcers on it and, 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 and have, you know, various different languages put on top of just your effects. Well, it started to get to the point where they wanted you to roll a separate cut of music 
you know, so whenever we'd go to a commercial break, they'd want you to roll a different kind of music for the international fee than what you're doing for your domestic fee. So now I introduce another digit cart machine. So it's like, well, how, how many hands do we need to have in order to make this happen? Yeah. So, you know, so, so as a mixer, you're starting to raise your hand and you're going, um, hello, we're kind of, you know, uh, how do you expect us to do this? Well, then now you start to look at the Inco machines and other things. Uh, and today the Ableton's where you can, you know, hit multiple buttons and send out stereo buses. You know, we did not have that then. So you had a lot more bells and whistles. Now you're starting to get into the digital age where you still have to dial in your comms. You still have to mix your show. But now, because there was no standard in the trucks at the time, you're starting to see a hybrid of analog boards. You're starting to see digital boards. And then you'd walk into the truck where you'd be fully confident that you could figure out an analog board and you would have this vertical learning curve on some of these consoles where you're buried deep in menus in order to just, you know, turn up an EQ. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it start the pressure's higher and higher on what I call a same set shoot date, which is um, an MBA is a same set shoot date. You show up at six, seven, eight o'clock in the morning and you go on air six, seven hours later or eight hours later, whatever it happens to be. But during that period of time, you've got just that day to get things figured out and set up and routed and faxed, you know, and it started to get crazy. It was like, oh my gosh, I, it, in fact, one of the straws for me actually involved the Lakers. Um, and it was when, I don't know if you know who Sue Stratton is, but she was the producer for the Lakers uh, television uh, telecast for years. She's, she's, she's an icon basically as a producer in sports. And Sue, um, it's just right when a new production company ha- was coming into play about eight or nine years ago in, and, and Sue was starting to go into retirement and, and the new production call, called me, I was in Charlotte at the time. They knew I would do some of the side by sides in Charlotte. And they're like, you know, Jerry, will you do our Laker feed? You know, when we come to Charlotte, I was like, well, let me do some due diligence. I'll, yeah, I'll mix your show. Um, if the, if I know the board, if I know the EICs and it, you know, because I want, I want them to have a good show and I want to have a good show. So I, so I called, I believe it was an NEP truck. I can't remember, but anyway, there was a PM one D board in, in this truck, which is not a common board that you would see in a truck at that time. You would see them maybe in some front of houses, but definitely not a lot of them in the broadcast trucks. So when I called, the EICs didn't know the truck that well. I called a lot of my A1 friends. They were like, they wouldn't touch the board. <laughs> They're like, I, they were like, I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. So I was like, well, if they're not touching it, and they're far more seasoned than I am doing these games, then I need to, I need to just say no. And I remember it, you know, and then Sue called me and she said, Oh, Jerry, thank you so much. I know you'd be fine. But I said, no, I said, I'm not going to do you justice. If I actually do this, it's going to be too much of a ramp up and, and you, you need to get Anthony and just fly him out here. So the production company from, for the Lakers were upset. They were, they were calling me and they're going, Oh, Jerry, man, you're killing us, man. Yeah, I know you can do it. And I was like, I, it's not a matter if I can do it. It's a matter of having a pleasant show. Yeah. <laughs> and I just didn't, I just didn't, I, you know, if I'd had a, a, a set day before and had time to ramp up, then I would have done it. But I, I just, you know, it, and, and that was when things started to change for me too. It was like there was, you're, you're getting a lot of things that were, could be either digital or they could be analog or they could be a, a hybrid. You know, you're starting to now see the, I think the last digital console might've been a, it might've been a 5D and I, I was fine on that, but, but there was no consistency on what you're going to find in these broadcast trucks. And, and, I started to go, you know, I'm doing the audio in the truck. I'm doing the comms in the truck. There's a profound amount of stress. And 
I just, I need to work smarter for me. You know, now I, I will still go mix and I'll still do a, a few things. If I, one, if I know the front bench production and if I know the truck, I'll still do it. But I really, really started doing more RF taking and that had its own challenges. And it was just to me, just as exciting as being in the truck, but it was just a completely different element, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that, and it's, kind of like that. I mean, I, I took Eric to go see an NFL show and I just threw him in the truck for the hour before the show went up on the air and I didn't tell him anything. I just wanted him to watch my friend Jeff Cohen, who's a, an amazing mixer. And, and I just thought, you know, people don't have any idea what goes on in that truck and how, how chaotic it is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've worked on a lot of different sports is there a difference between them and how you approach them? Yes, there is a big difference between them. Uh, how you approach them in the truck isn't much different, but how they're all wired is extremely different. NFL, for example, um, always has a set day, which is the Saturday prior to your NFL date. So you have plenty of time to fax everything out and, and suss everything out and get everything wired and, and troubleshoot. So it makes it, for me, it makes it for a re- really pleasant experience. Some of your bigger NFL games, I mean, your, your college games will be like that as well. Major League Baseball, some of your big events will have a set day. Uh, some of your smaller events might be a same set shoot day. Um, when I say bigger events, meaning your national uh, games might have uh, a set day to them. NBA is always a same set shoot day. So it's usually a grind to get that up and running. But the inside of the truck really is not any different in the approach uh, between all of the sports and hockey. I need to add that in there too. That's a same set shoot day as well. Um, But the way they're all wider clearly uh completely different i just happen to like the nfl because i like the sport they like to do a lot of really fun and tricky things now um i think when i saw you at lunch i had just come off of the series the world series with um joe carpenter and david uh Huffafinger. those two guys they do the series every year and they wire things a little differently than what you would normally see during a season. And they are so good at what they do. And it's such a cookie cutter for them year after year that they win awards because of the, the things they do. Like, like, like some of them will actually put, let's say, uh, this is for an example, it could be another kind of wireless pack, but some of them will actually put it, let's say an SK250 transmitter in the bases and they'll drill a little hole and they'll put, I think it's maybe a Mickey two uh, mic element, which is a little tiny um, lavalier uh-huh. and they'll, they'll drill a hole just big enough to stick that little uh, Mickey two through. So you're getting all these effects and all these things that you would never hear on a normal baseball game. And that's why they win awards they, they go over and beyond to give you, these special effects. So the inside of the truck is not really approached any differently, but everything on the outside is completely different. The kind of mics you use, uh, how long it takes for you to set them up, how many people you have on your crew, you know, they're all different. I'm curious, how many channels, audio channels, would a typical baseball game or NFL game be using? All right, so on a, on a, normal, on a normal NFL game, A C-level game, and by the way, NFL is broken down between A, B, C, and D games. I don't know if they go any further than that, but your A game is always going to be your biggest national broadcast of the day, Uh, and that's always going to be Joe Buck and um, Troy Aikman. That's going to be the highest-rated NFC game. Same way for for CBS, the A game is going to – they're going to have a little bit more – uh, cameras, more mics, a little bit more punch to them because they're they're going to be nationally broadcast. And then your B game is going to be your next biggest, and they go by ratings. Um, and then your C is going to be, you know, your next level down as far as viewership. 
But on a normal sea level game, on a normal sea level game, there's about 85 channels of audio. On the Thursday night game, I believe that there were 168 channels of audio, three fiber systems and Maddie and a combination of all the above. So 85 channels of audio versus 168 channels for a Thursday night game. It might even be more than that this year because that was last year. I believe that there is uh, about 16 cameras on a normal NFL game, but on the Thursday night football game, and you could pretty much say it's going to be similar for a Sunday night game as well as a Monday night football game, as about 45 cameras. could be up to 50. I've seen 52 to 54 cameras. Wow. Yeah, and that's why you have a submixer because because you know, you've got you've got you've got mics on cameras that you're actually taking down CCUs. You know, that yeah. you've got effects that you're taking. You've got you've got all the parabs and all of the different things going on in the field. You need because getting back to the real estate that we were talking about earlier, I mean, if you're just mixing your show, which is several tape decks of stereo pairs, sometimes now four, your your announce headsets, your effects, I mean, and your music cuts, which now you've got coming from various sources, you're running out of real estate. So you need a submixer in there to actually wrangle a lot of those channels down for your effects so that you have some kind of control over it. So that's why that's why so many channels there. That's an enormous number for a live event to have to worry about. Wow, I can see why the stress level is high. The stress level is enormous. It's enormous. And, and it's, there's, there's a certain personality type that, that, that needs to be sitting in that truck. One, somebody who's an adrenaline junkie to begin with. Two, that, that can think on their feet and not melt down when things go south. Because they, they more often go south. I wouldn't say more often than not, but there's there's things that happen in that truck that no one would ever know that goes on. And you kind of have to think on your feet and you have to be able to figure it out, you know, on your feet. But but the people that have been staying in the seat as long as I've been around have done it as long as I've been around. And they're so good at it, you know, that it's just like, oh, well, I'll just deal with it. You know, yeah, it's yeah. kind of like we all do when we, when we get into a groove somewhere. But there's a there's a ton of stuff going on there that people just that's why when I took Eric, it's like it's not what you think. I didn't even tell him, you know, what to expect. I just threw him in the truck. Wow. And, 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 and I'll give you an example of what it's like to sit there. You're mixing, right? You've got your, your, your stereo and your surrounds going as far as your speakers. And in addition to that, this is the way I would do it, on, on my left-hand side, I have a little Fostex that I listen to my director's hot mic on because I want to hear him cut over everybody else. And then over on the right side, I have my producer Fostex because I kind of want to hear the direction that the show is going. I want to kind of have a clue where he's, what he's thinking. And then in the center of that, I have these little roller speakers because I need to hear the tape room and the guys and the girls in, the, in tape because I need to know what traffic is and I need to hear my AD. So you're listening in a way more to them than you are your mix, but you're listening. You find a way to, to make it work. And Eric's like, I don't know how you, how these people hear anything. Yeah. Yeah. I can't even imagine. There's so many different conversations going on at the same time that it's hard enough to keep track of one sometimes, let alone all of that. Wow. And your mix. Yeah, it, it's managed chaos is what it is. But it's a glorious thing when it's wor- when it works. It's like, oh, okay. And then when it works, you're like, oh, I want to do it again. You know? Yeah, yeah. Right, right, like, right. Oof. But I've had a few that were exciting that went way south. You know, and it, I, I don't think there's an A1 alive. I tell people that, that, that are still in that truck that, that, that if something hasn't gone way south on you, you're either green or you're lying. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know if that's fair to say, but, but, you know, we've all, we've all had mishaps in the truck and I don't know how sometimes I got called back on some of them that were just downright miserable. 
you know, but then you, it's like birth, you know, you, you move on and you learn from it and you, you learn what not to do again. And, you know, for you know it, you're back in the seat. Are most of the mishaps a result of a technical problem? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes it's pilot error. Sometimes it's a uh, uh, lack of direction. Sometimes it's, it could be a number of things. I mean, I, you know, I've had things happen where uh, it was totally me, you know, where I might have miscued something. Or there's times when the director just won't call things for you. So you, you almost, when you're in that seat, at least what I do is I, I hit that, I hit that director button. I go, where are you going? Huh. I will always ask him where he's going. Where are you going? You want a music cut here? You're going to highlight? You, you almost have to be a little bit proactive. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a lot of things that can go wrong. I mean, there's times when, when we've had hardwire mics or wireless mics down on the field that were taking RF hits. And you have, uh, this is the way I roll. I, I have seen some, some A1s, you know, tell their producer and, and director, because it gets pretty heated in the truck. And there's tempers that sometimes fly and people are yelling and screaming and and I just find that honesty is the best policy. It's like, you know, I'll hit my producer and director's button and say, do not toss to the field until I get back to you because that mic's not working. And they'll go, oh, my God, what happened to the mic? Oh, my God. And I go, I don't know. We're working on it. But don't toss to them right now because it's better to be honest than to tell them that it's fine. Yeah. You know, there's a workaround. It's like, you know, don't go to the RF mic now. We need to go to the backup. Wait till they get there. You know, and we have pre-fades. We can hit the pre-fades and hear things while we're mixing all the time. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that can go. There's so much going on out there that, that I'm surprised sometimes that more things don't go wrong than they do. What did you do on the past World Series? Oh, you know what? On this past World Series, Bobby, first of all, first of all, I'm the luckiest human alive to have even been called to go work this series, being here in town and being that the Dodgers were in a series, you know, it, it was an emotional series to be involved with. What I did on this series was so simple and so easy. Uh, again, Joe Carpenter and, and, and Dave Hess, we call him Hess. Um, Fox sports called me. I, I had actually been booked to go to Romania for, for another event. Um, and, on, on a series like this, they have so many audio positions that they, they've got their crew that's got this dialed in that travels and does the series uh, because they do the whole season. So what I did was I was assigned to the third base dugout, which happened to just be the Dodgers dugout. We had a headset and a stick mic there that, that we would normally use during a regular series uh, if it wasn't the world series, we would use that headset. There's one in each dugout. Let me back up and say there's a headset and a stick mic in each dugout so that during the third inning and the sixth innings during a normal game, they normally toss to one of the other coaches and they have a little chat for a minute and they might talk to a player and you put the headset on them and, and you go about your day. Well, this was wired in the same manner, except it was there in case we needed it. So my job was really just to manage and babysit that. That's what I did on the series. You know, I didn't have all the crazy chaos and they, and they had so many audio people that they would have two or three people doing the pregame show. They'd have one of us in the third base dugout, one of us in the first base dugout. Um, the person in the third base dugout would also go to that team's locker room uh, in the event of a win or a loss. Same thing with the first base dugout. They would have one or two RF techs. They'd have one or two people in the booth. They'd have one person doing a submix. They'd have one, one, maybe two people doing comms because it's such a big show that there's one person in each position just to make sure that, that everything's going to go smoothly. Wow. So I just luckily enough was sitting in the Dodger dugout. Doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, definitely. Pretty dead cool. And it was just luck. It just happened to be where I was sent. 
And to be honest with you, Bobby, you, you know, I have so much respect for, for Joe Carpenter. We call him Carp, and I've known him for a long time. I have so much respect for the, the crew that wins Emmys every year that does this. And I was just delighted just to be on the call list, you know? Yeah. And to be there and to be with the guys and see their highs and their lows and, and the coach and, the, and all the people that work for him. It was just, I don't know, to me it was just, I felt like the luckiest person in the world. To, to have gotten that, that and to be in that position. At least on baseball, I've been in the truck for a little bit on local games, and I've been on the field a little bit with some of the audio people. And, and this was a long time ago, and that's one of the reasons why I asked you how things have evolved, because I don't remember it being that crazy and that chaotic when I was around it, be it only for a short period of time. So that's why it's very cool to hear the real stories of what it's like right now. Well, you don't see that unless you, unless you are, when you're really going to see it is like the hour, the hour and a half prior to going to air. Ah, I see. You okay. know, and, and I don't want to be around the A1 sometimes when all that's going on. Cause there's so much happening in there, but, but people don't, I don't think they really know unless they really see it. Sure. You know, how, how nutty it really is. But at the same time, it's exciting, Bobby. It's exciting and it's fun. And when you do it, just like, oh my gosh, that rocket did not explode on the launch pad. I want to do it again. Yeah, <laughs> you know? right. yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, oh. Jerry, last question. So what is the best piece of business advice that maybe you received from somebody or maybe you learned along the way? Business advice that I got from somebody else or what I would pass on to someone? Either. Or both. Or either or both. Um, well, first of all, I think that if you're if you're a freelancer, I think it's really important to get a good accountant that understands the business and your write-offs and uh, and can help you navigate that. Um, two, set up some kind of retirement account that you put the money in yourself because some some of the some of what you do out there has some unions to it. Some of them does not. Always squirrel some money away while you're while while I call making hay while the sun shines because you will be rapidly busy, and then you'll have a, a what I call the slow season, where the phone doesn't ring as much and and I think everybody that's a freelancer freaks out uh, on this roller coaster and goes oh my god I'm never going to work again and and then and then it ramps back up again and then you busier than you you know you don't have time to even visit family you get so busy. So I think squirreling, knowing how to squirrel money away while you're, while you're making hay so that you, you can kind of cruise while, while it gets slow because it will always ramp up and down. Have faith, work hard, learn everything you can about your business. And a big one is, and, and this is not even a sour grapes thing, this is a reality check. I, I think that sometimes... And some girls get it, I think, sometimes a little more than guys do, uh, just by design. But I've always worked around truly amazing people, but not everyone is going to like you. Mm, and right. if you get into a clique or a group of people that just don't want to, to see you succeed, I believe that it's in your best interest to find your path that suits you. Because my belief is, go where you are celebrated, not where you are tolerated. And I truly, truly in the core of my soul really believe that, Bobby. Because I believe if somebody really doesn't want you to succeed, you won't there. That's not the place for you. Find the place where, where people celebrate what you're bringing to the table and you will always flourish. You will always succeed if you surround yourself with that. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, send them to questions at bobbyownercircle.com. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com. It's like the podcast tab. Or you can go to bobbyownercircle.com or find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, or Google Play. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyownercircle.com, you'll also find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts to new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. Bye.